Snowflake is an incredibly fast-growing cloud-native company that is taking over the data space. This company has not only tripled in size over the past two years, but it has managed to make itself a leader in the areas of data storage, data transport, and data analytics. The stock is currently up 30% from where it sat just two weeks ago after reporting their earnings for Q1 2022. Yes, I know it's still 2021, but that's what they call them. And in those earnings, they show that they are growing 110% year over year, but they also forecast forecast that that earnings growth would likely slow down in the future. So in this video, I'm going to go over Snowflake's background as a company, look at their most recent earnings reports, and talk about what it will take for them to be successful in the future. Lastly, stick around until the end of the video to see whether or not I personally invest more money into Snowflake. For this video, I read through Snowflake's entire earnings call transcript for their last quarterly earnings, and it was not short. So if you appreciate that kind of effort, please just hit the like button below, and let's jump into first looking at Snowflake's background as a company. Snowflake was founded in 2012 in San Mateo, California by three former data architects from Oracle. They spent two years in stealth mode developing both the product and building up venture funding before finally launching their product to the public in 2015. At that point, they had managed to gather over $1.4 billion in venture funding for their business. They have had several CEOs since then, starting with Mike Spicer, a venture capitalist, followed by Bob Muglia of Microsoft fame in 2014, and then that was finally followed up by Frank Slootman in 2019. It was Frank who initially brought up the idea of taking Snowflake public, something that actually happened in September of 2020. Now in the second half of 2020, there was a lot of hype around cloud computing stocks in general. You can see that just by going back and looking at some of my portfolio reviews at the time, the market was white hot. And so because of that, when Snowflake IPO'd in September 2020, it almost immediately doubled in value, getting to a valuation of $71.4 billion, making it the most valuable software IPO of all time. When that IPO happened, I was actually extremely interested in Snowflake and the products that they produced, but I just wasn't willing to invest in them at such a ridiculously high valuation. Over time, the stock price ended up dropping while they continued to grow their company, and so at a certain point, I realized that I felt comfortable investing in the company. I ended up buying a small position in the company after making my previous video on Snowflake. But why all the hype around Snowflake in the first place? What do they actually do? Well, Snowflake is a data company, and data is fundamental to how modern businesses work. The more and better data you have, the better you can predict customer trends, make strategic decisions, or even optimize the customer experience. The problem is, traditional methods of handling data just aren't built for modern businesses. Back in the day, people used to use spreadsheets to track their data. Later, once computers were invented, they started using databases, which could handle much larger amounts of data. After a while, these evolved into data warehouses, which were giant, literal warehouses of really well-structured data that you could run analytics on. From this also evolved the data lake, which were basically vast pools of unstructured data which you could go into and perform all different types of analyses on to try to extract value for your business. Each of those separate changes represented a paradigm shift in the world of data, and they unlocked incredible amounts of value. But with modern businesses ingesting data from customer transactions, Internet of Things devices, mobile applications, there's just too much data coming in to use traditional data warehousing or even data lake methods. Methods. So the next step has been to move companies off of their own private data servers and into the public cloud, operated by companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. This lets these companies handle all the day-to-day -day operations, such as securing the servers, making sure everything's working, handling all the hardware, and the companies can just worry about the software. This gives an order of magnitude less complexity for the individual companies to handle because it's already being handled by the cloud providers. But then Snowflake came along and took this one step further. Snowflake offers a one-stop shop with a single extensible data platform that essentially handles all the provisioning of private virtual servers in the cloud. Snowflake offers a solution for data warehousing, for data lakes, for data analytics, for data transport. Everything you would need to do with your data, Snowflake has pre-built applications that can handle that for you. And they do all of this on a consumption basis, meaning that you only pay for what you use. This means that there's an additional order of magnitude less complexity and cost for these companies because Snowflake can handle an essentially infinite amount of data for them. And the companies can just pay Snowflake for the service. And the next step on Snowflake's roadmap is something they call the data cloud. Right now, Snowflake offers a data cloud platform where customers can store their data, run analytics against that data, and then use those insights to actually change their business. Data cloud is one step further. It's the idea that in real time, you can push data to the cloud, and then that data can influence your business functions immediately in real time. Think about how when you buy an item on Amazon, 
on, you immediately start getting recommendations for other similar items. Now imagine taking that same process and moving it out into the physical world. Let's say it's a hot day in Chicago and a bunch of people are going to McDonald's to buy ice cream. Well, McDonald's could see this and instantly put in an order for more ice cream supplies, hopefully making it so that their ice cream machines aren't always out of order. In the new digital economy, Snowflake is making the bet that data is going to become the core of most companies' businesses. And Snowflake plans to run the software at the core of that new economy, the data cloud. But that's all really just a nice story, and it doesn't really mean anything unless there's numbers to back it up. So let's now look at Snowflake's Q1 2021 earnings report and see how they've been performing and what they forecast for the future. Looking first at their revenue, they grew their product revenue to $214 million this past quarter, up 110% year over year. It's good to note that this kind of revenue is not incurred on a monthly basis like a lot of software as a service companies that I talk about. Instead, Snowflake uses a consumption-based model. So essentially, the more that a company uses Snowflake's tools and platform, the more money they'll pay for that usage. Their revenue grew even faster outside the United States, with EMEA countries growing revenue 200% and Asia Pacific growing their revenue over 300% year over year. Their net retention rate hit 168% this quarter, meaning that for every dollar a customer spent last year, they spent $1.68 this year. This is a really good sign that customers like the platform and once they get a taste of it, they wanna use it even more in the future. They are also confident that this net retention rate will stay above 160% for the rest of the fiscal year. That seems pretty reasonable because the lowest their net retention rate has dropped in the last four quarters was 158%. And that was right at the start of a global crisis that had most companies in the world panicking. So if that's the worst case scenario, I'm pretty happy. Looking next at their customers, they now have 104 customers who spent over a million dollars over the past year. That's essentially a 35% increase in their largest customers in just the last three months. Now this isn't guaranteed to continue because they do receive their revenues based on a consumption model. So it's possible that some of those companies would have had large projects that were going to spin down over the next few quarters. But that being said, Snowflake also added 393 net new customers in the first quarter of 2022, including three seven-figure logos, including Datadog and Equifax. They're also actively pursuing larger customers now because they know once they land a customer, they tend to take over multiple functions in that customer's business. So the larger the customer they can land, the more potential future revenue they're going to earn from that customer. If you compare this to say Palantir, this is kind of the opposite approach that they're taking where they're starting to expand into attracting smaller customers. Snowflake's gross product margin was 72%, which is up 600 basis points from a year ago. They contribute this to favorable cloud service agreements, increasing scale across the world with all of their different customers, as well as the success that some of their enterprise customers have seen while using the platform. Operating margin was negative 16%, so overall, Snowflake is still not profitable, but we would hope to see this number improve as they continue to scale. Looking at their cash position, they currently have $5.1 billion in cash and cash equivalents on the sidelines. Part of the reason for that is their Snowflake's venture business, which uses that cash position to invest in up and coming data technology companies. Two companies that they recently announced they invested in include ThoughtSpot and Dataiku. But turning now to look toward their future, Snowflake also announced their forecasted earnings for both next quarter as well as for the entire fiscal year of 2022. For Q2 of 2022, they estimate that their revenue will be between 235 and 240 million, representing year-over-year -year growth between 88% and 92%. For the full fiscal year of 2022, they estimate that their revenue will be between 1.02 and 1.035 billion dollars. This would represent a year-over-year -year growth rate between 84% and 87%. Turning to profitability, they expect their non-GAAP gross margins to still be around 72% for the entire year, and they expect their overall operating margin to drop to negative 17%. They also plan to add an additional 1,200 net new employees across the next fiscal year, which will represent a very large growth in their overall employee headcount. Now, these forecasts do look like a slight improvement over what they issued last quarter, but they still represent a pretty big slowdown in the overall growth of the company. They're forecasting their revenue growth in the mid to high 80% versus last year they grew 120% and the year before that they grew 164% year over year. This is obviously a trend that we don't want to see continue happening. We don't want them to grow slower and slower every subsequent year. But that being said, because their growth rate was already so ridiculously high, it's still nearly double both Palantir and Datadog's respective growth rates. Now those two companies aren't necessarily direct competitors with Snowflake,
Snowflake, but they are involved in the data space, so that's why I chose them as examples. But outside of their immediate forecasts, what areas do we need to be watching in order to know whether or not Snowflake is being run well and leadership is making the right decisions? Well, we know that Snowflake is focusing on growing in two major areas. One, growing their large customers in the US, and two, growing internationally. So we would hope to see their number of customers spending at least $1 million each year on Snowflake's platform start to increase more and more year over year. Now they have grown their number of Fortune 500 customers using their products 30% year over year, but many of those customers have not yet had time to fully ramp up onto the platform. Snowflake CEO mentioned that it can take as long as nine months for them to start seeing the full impact of the revenue of signing on a new large customer. So likely some of those Fortune 500 customers are going to start producing significant revenue next year. Leadership also mentioned that they are actively looking to expand internationally and set up local leadership teams in different regions around the world. They made some changes in the leadership in Asia Pacific and that clearly worked out because that region alone grew revenue 300% year over year. Leadership also said that they have high hopes for the growth that they're going to start seeing soon in Japan. Now outside of pursuing new customers, Snowflake will also need to focus on differentiating their products from competitors, especially in the market that they're competing in. Now you might think that Snowflake's competitors would be companies like Datadog or Palantir, but according to Gartner, Snowflake's most direct competition are cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and GCP. These companies are continuously rolling out updates to their customers and adding new products to the platform all the time. A lot of the time, these new products directly compete with smaller providers that were offering similar services as an add-on to their platform. So if Snowflake were to try to sit back and coast on the technology that they've already built, I'd be willing to bet that within a year or two, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google would have built the exact same technology directly into their cloud platforms. Now I did mention that Snowflake is one step ahead of these competitors in the cloud data market, but they're going to need to continue to innovate in order to keep that lead. And their new strategic vision for the data cloud is going to be key to that success. Now it's not yet clear how big this data cloud market is going to be, but it will presumably dwarf the current $81 billion in total addressable market for cloud data platforms. As pretty much every enterprise is going to need this technology. The same way that every company now is moving to the cloud and every company 10 years ago needed to get on the internet. And one way that Snowflake is working to build a moat around its technology in this area is through data sharing. Basically on Snowflake's platform, companies can choose to share their data with other companies in exchange for receiving some of their data back. They do this using something called data edges, which are essentially relationships between different companies or industries that let them share data with each each other. Now companies share their data for different reasons, but they're all seeking to enrich their data, gain better insights from their analytics, and to do so more cost effectively and more quickly. And Snowflake saw the number of data edges being used increase 35%, with 15% of their customer base currently making use of this functionality. So these customers that are sharing data edges with other companies are very likely to stick with Snowflake's platform because the cost of leaving isn't just losing the functionality, it's also losing that data relationship that they'd set up. If that relationship is important to running their business, they can't really cut that so easily. So Snowflake's products are currently ahead of their largest competitors and they're still growing at an incredible rate. If they can manage to successfully move into the data cloud market while continuing to grow their number of large customers and their international customers, this company still has a huge runway to grow. While the company has had a traditionally very high valuation, if they can sustain their growth long enough, eventually that growth will catch up to their valuation. So what have I done based on these earnings? Well, I have not purchased any additional shares of Snowflake, but I still hold on to all the same shares that I purchased after my last video. But let me know if you're going to be investing in Snowflake. If you sign up for M1 Finance, you'll get $30 when you deposit $100, so that's basically a free 30% return on your investment. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.